Why do bad line calls happen so often in amateur tennis, and what can you do about it? No. Nope. What? Way out. Middle of the box. Way out. In this lesson, I'm going to answer those questions and many more. My name is Ian. I'm the founder of EssentialTennis.com, where over the years, I've helped more than a million tennis players improve through my YouTube lessons, my podcast, my best-selling book on Amazon. Let's go ahead and jump right into today's lesson. To start, let's look at two real-world examples of bad line calls. The first one comes to us from Scott, AKA Angry Old Man. He was playing against a tough opponent who went for a big offensive shot down the line. Scott watched, made the call. He was standing still, called it out, and the replay clearly showed that he was wrong. What's really interesting about this example is he wasn't running, he wasn't stretching, he was just kind of standing there watching it. He had a perfect view of the line, looking right down the line, and he just plain blew the call. The second example comes to us courtesy of Ben, AKA most exhausting player. And in a recent tough match against a former NCAA player, he made this call, which also was clearly wrong to such an extent that the owner of the Tennis Troll channel, which you should def definitely subscribe to, went to Ben's house with camera in hand to ask him about the call after watching it back. So what do these two situations have in common? Well, it's three big things. Number one, in both cases, they were playing friendly but competitive matches. This wasn't a tournament match or there wasn't any money on the line. They weren't playing for a trophy or anything like that. But number two, both players knew that they were being recorded by multiple cameras and more than likely tens of thousands of people were gonna watch the match and see any potential bad calls that they were gonna make. And thirdly, and probably most importantly, I personally know both of these players. Ben, I've spent dozens of hours with. We've played a match together. He's traveled here to Wisconsin. We've collaborated together on content. And in the case of Scott, we've spent probably hundreds of hours together. We've done a lot of coaching together. He's played a lot of matches on my channel. He's traveled with me to Hawaii and Costa Rica to help me train other players. And in both the case of Scott and Ben, I can say like without hesitation, they're two of the best most genuine, most honest people that I've ever spent time with on or off the court. And neither of them ever, I can say this without a shadow of a doubt, would purposefully make a bad call. So how is it then that they both made these calls that were so incorrect? We'll come back around and answer that question in just a second. But first, let's consider the people who do this for a living. The people that we've seen on TV for decades and decades and decades calling the lines for the biggest, most important matches that have ever been played in the history of tennis. Believe it or not, these people have gone through really stringent and rigid processes in order to be in that position in the first place. For example, you have to fill out an application, have it signed by a sectional chairman in the USTA. You also have to take a written test before you do any training for the job. You have to have confirmed 2020 vision, either corrected or uncorrected. You have to attend annual training to continue your upkeep with your ability to perform that duty. And also you have to complete increasingly difficult certifications for higher and higher and higher levels of competition. Let's also quickly consider these six facts, which are really important. Fact number one is they don't have a dog in the race. Like it doesn't matter to them who wins or loses. They're not gonna make more money or like get a win if like X call is out or X call is in. Maybe they have like a favorite player who's playing or something like that. But obviously that's not factoring into whether or not they call a ball in or out. And that's because fact number two, they know that if they get it wrong, they're gonna be absolutely despised and hated by the fans, the players, like everybody watching on TV. Nobody wants to get it wrong. They're trying their hardest to get every call correct. Fact number three is they're only responsible for one line. Fact number four is they're perfectly positioned to call that one line. They're not running around, and that's fact number five. They're not chasing and scrambling around. They're perfectly positioned, they're perfectly calm, they're perfectly steady looking at that one line. And when you're the player, you're having to call all the lines all the time. Even if you're on the opposite end of the courts, these line judges don't have any of those six challenges. If this video has already been helpful to you, then please do me a favor and click that like button. It helps with the YouTube algorithm. Thank you so much. So in the case of those professional line judges, in spite of being trained, 
perfectly positioned, being fully prepared, having their bodies be totally still and totally prepared to just do that one job on that one line, they got calls wrong all the time. <laughs> I know it's kind of popular to kind of hate on the line judges and be like, oh man, their vision's so bad and what are they looking at and stuff like that. But have you ever really stopped and thought to consider all the preparation and training that they've had and that they're probably doing about as good of a job as anybody can? As you may know, the human line judges have been slowly starting to get replaced by, by Hawkeye, which is computer and camera based system. And I saw a, an article from NPR, we'll link to it down in the description below, where Sean Carey, who oversees the officiating for U the United States Tennis Association at the US Open, said that when they compared the human line judges to the computer system, when a challenge was made by one player or the other, the human got the call wrong 25% of the time. And that's just during challenges. They make mistakes all the time. So why are there so many bad calls in amateur tennis? Well, in short, it's really, really hard to be right all the time. In fact, you've been wrong a bunch. I have too. So has every other tennis player who's ever played tennis. When you look at the statistics of, play, of humans who are in the perfect position and trained and they have one job to do, they still get it wrong a pretty good chunk of the time. But for the rest of us who are running all around the courts, we're doing crazy stuff with our bodies, trying to hit the ball, we're in a bad position, having to look across to another random line. Our heart rate is at like 140 beats per minute. All of those things are all working against us. Of course we're gonna get it wrong once in a while. It happens to all of us, no matter how nice of a person we are, no matter how honest we are, no matter how fair-minded we are, all of us have made bad calls. It's universal and just part of the competitive game of tennis. To address the elephant in the room head on, does deliberate cheating happen in tennis in everyday amateur matches? Yeah, it does, it does happen. It's definitely happened to me, but is it the majority of bad calls that happen? Absolutely not. The large majority of bad calls that happen are honest mistakes made by honest people who really thought that they were making the right call. So what can you do about it in the moment? And you're pretty sure a bad call just happened and you don't want your quality of play to totally tank. Here's five steps so you can play your best tennis even after a tough call. Step number one is to remind yourself that it's very possible that you're wrong about what just happened. Because keep in mind, this is your best judgment from the other side of the court. You're running around too. Number two, remind yourself that the vast majority of bad calls aren't malicious and they're just honest mistakes. Number three, remind yourself that if you choose to fixate, and it is a choice, if you choose to mentally fixate on the negative emotions of like, oh man, they just cheated me, and man, they're such a cheater, and this is so terrible, and I should be winning this match, you know, so you know what I'm talking about. If you allow that mental fixation to happen, remind yourself that your quality of play will decrease. Number four, Remind yourself of something very practical and tangible that you can focus on that's positive at the very next point. Maybe where to aim your serve, or what pattern you'd like to play, or what target you'd like to shift. And step number five is to grab onto that positive mental shift and continue to reinforce it, and that will give you your best chance of playing your best tennis for the rest of the match.